Hello and, and welcome to what we hope to be the first in a series of talks in the run-up to the 900th anniversary of the founding of Reading Abbey. The talks have been arranged by the Friends of Adding Reading Abbey. Um, they've been facilitated by the events team at Reading Borough Council. Indeed we've got Lucy and Sean this morning here running sound and camera. We're also grateful to the Reading Museum for hosting us today. I'm delighted to have been asked by four to, to chair the talks. Um, I have a keen interest in the Abbey and indeed nominated four as one of the organisations I'm supporting uh, during my mayoral year. Today we're going to be talking about the, the stone of the coronation of the Virgin. In fact, this stone right behind us. And our speaker is, is John Mulaney. So hello, John. Hello. John will be known, probably well known, in fact, to members of Fora. Um, but for those of you who don't know him, John is half Irish and half Italian, and I'll leave you to work out which half is maternal. He did his first degree in Latin, philosophy and theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Then spent six years in a monastery in Italy with the possibility of actually becoming a monk. He didn't, and he, became, and he came back to England and read for a master's degree in history at Reading University. And he spent his career teaching, and for 25 years ran the Caversham Bookshop um, in Prospect Street, which I remember. Uh, I remember buying a number of books from there. He continues to write and lecture primarily about the, the history of Reading Abbey, the town, and the Catholic Church in England. He also runs the publishing house, the Scallop Shell Press, and he's just published his book, A Tale of Two Towns, Caliver and Reading, which I thoroughly recommend to you. He's also married to Lindsay. Um, so John, I think, is an ideal choice to give our first talk. So John, I think probably the most important question first, um, how's Lindsay spending her retirement and the days in COVID recently? A mix of looking after grandchildren, allotment, and doing research, writing books and giving talks until, of course, recently when no talks have been given. And um, what has she written recently? She's written a book about Henry because such a lot of interest regarding Henry and his bones. There seems to be a renewed interest in digging up Henry, who uh, is buried in the Abbey. We know exactly to within a few feet where he was buried, but uh, within a few feet makes quite a bit of a difference. Uh, so, but she's not looking for the bones, she was looking for the real Henry. Who was Henry and how has he affected us and our town and even our country today? So her okay. book is called Henry and His Abbey. Excellent. So a book just about to be published. We thought we'd better get that out of the oh, way. Yeah. And, and John will now be let back in the house later uh, on this uh, morning. Yes. <laughs> so we'll be talking, we think, for about 30 minutes. Um, John has previously asserted that the stone is one of the most important pieces of medieval sculpture in England. And I think the idea of this morning is to hope that at the end of our talk, he'll have persuaded you of his case. So, John, what are we actually looking at here? What we've got is a very small piece of stone. It's about a foot across, I suppose. And it was discovered in 1949 by George Nesky, the uh, director of the Cordial Institute, but not here in Reading, it's found down the river. And if we look at it, it's a rather unimpressive piece of stone. It's been knocked around about quite a bit, and uh, what do we see on it? Well, there's a figure of a seated lady, and she's holding something to her chest, something like this. And to her left, there's an arm appearing with a hand hovering over her head. So what are we looking at? Well, what I'm going to try to convince you is that this is, in fact, an iconic piece of work. And by that, I mean it is important to the history of art, not just in England, but in Europe. Because what we're looking at is an archetype of a idea that persisted through the Middle Ages and even up to today. So we can find another similar object west of Oxford in a place called Creddington. And that's a tympanum, in other words, an archway over the door of the church of St. Swithin in Creddington. And that shows the whole of this representation. It shows the seated woman, our uh, man also seated beside her, holding a crown over her head. And I propose this is the same image. It's important because it's the first representation of this idea in Europe that we know about. And the one that was so important and has been so important for the next, one might say, thousand years. So are we saying that before this, 
position of Mary was, was not as significant in the, in the role of the church and the theology. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I would say that it was very significant, but this is a particular idea that was coming through around about the year 1000, 1100, 1200. Uh, and it's linked with a very obscure and rather difficult notion, a theological notion, uh, about the role of um, the Virgin Mary as the mother of God. Now, that itself is a rather strange terminology, mother of God. But I think if we go to the uh, Greek and the Latin, the Theotokos in Greek and Deipra in Latin, uh, this means, in fact, the bearer of God, because she is going to be, in the Christian belief, the one, the human being, who carries Jesus, who is God. Now, a lot of theological argument about that, and we certainly don't want to go right. into it. Um, but her role, therefore, is of the mother, we call in English, the mother of God, and also in Latin, mother of God, and also in Greek, they refer to it as the mother of God. But if we think upon it more, she's the one who is the one who gives birth to the person who is God and man. Right, so we understand that, but, but are we suggesting that this idea wasn't being represented in art prior to the sort of 1000s? As far as we know, we can't find direct references to it like that, no. I mean, there are references to the fact that she is the mother of God, yes. I mean, in fact, we've got icons going back um, to, to the middle of the uh, first millennium, which say, describe her as being uh, in Greek, uh, the Mater Theo, the mother of God, right. written on the icons. So we have got this idea there, but then coming from that, you've got the idea that she it becomes the Queen of Heaven. And, and that seems to be the important point here, that she's being crowned. That's so, exactly. so we have to move from the idea of mother bearer of God to the Queen of Heaven, and that is the point here, this is one of the earliest depictions of that particular point. That's exactly the case. And it's this belief that she is, in fact, because she is the, the mother of God, she has a special place in eternity, and she goes up to heaven, and she is crowned. Now, the whole point there is whether she dies or not. Yeah. And also it's connected with another very contentious belief, which is, and this is a terminology which has divided Christianity, I think, over the years, which is the Immaculate Conception. And if I can make a little bit of a pun here. Simplify it for us. Yes. Um, the Immaculate Conception, the idea is that Mary, because she is going to become the bearer of God, the one who is chosen from all of humanity to be the one who brings God onto earth, um, she can't have any sin. Now, if she hasn't got any sin, therefore she has to be conceived without sin. Now, that does not mean that her parents did not have normal uh, sexual relationships for her to become a pregnant lady. No, her parents, Mary's parents, were um, Anne and Jerkin, and she was born in a natural way. So the idea of macular conception is just a purely spiritual one that, unlike the rest of humanity, according to this belief system, Christianity, um, she was born without sin. In other words, immaculate without sin. That's all it means. It does not mean anything physical at all. So if I can try and summarise that in my rather sort of simplistic way, what I think I'm getting is the sense that church doctrine was evolving around this time, and the idea then that Mary, Mother of, of Heaven, or Mother of, 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 of um, God, and the, this is one of the earliest depictions of that idea, and the fact that she then was, she went up to Heaven, and she became the Queen of Heaven. And we haven't really seen that before, earlier than about, say, 1000 in, in art or in sculpture. That's right. I mean, there are hints of it, um, so I wouldn't like to be asking about that, but yeah. Jodineski, when he found this, uh, did say that this was the earliest representation in Europe, and I don't think anything's happened since then in our discoveries to contradict it. And so that's our significant sort of religious point as to why it's interesting. And of course, the other interesting aspect of this is, it's, we think, as far as we can tell, it was a stone in Reading Abbey. And what's the significance of it being Reading Abbey? Reading Abbey was founded, dedicated to the Virgin Mary and St. John. And if you think you go to a typical church and see the crucifixion, or in many paintings as well, and you have on the right-hand side of the crucified uh, Christ, you have Mary, and on the left-hand side you have St. John. Now that was the dedication of uh, the Reading Abbey. Later it became probably better known as the Abbey of the Hand of St. James, it dedicated St. James, because the hand was brought uh, to England by the Empress Matilda, when her husband, uh, uh, the Emperor of uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry V, Heinrich V, died, and she came back to England with many of the crown jewels. And 
probably the most prominent aspect, the crown jewels, was in fact the hand of St. James. So the Reading Abbey came dedicated to St. James, and St. James's hand appears on the seals, as Professor Kemp uh, in many of his books and uh, articles uh, it illustrates very conclusively. Mm -hmm. However, originally it was dedicated, the Abbey was dedicated to Mary. Uh, and there also, I always like to bring in, when I'm giving talks, a bit of uh, music into this, because there are various hymns and plain chant tones uh, and which are dedicated to Mary, so one being Salve Regina, which means Hail Queen. So we're coming back now to this Hail Queen idea, the Queen of Heaven. Okay. Um, so what we've got here is, I say, uh, objectively, a representation that is very important in the history of art. But I, I think, unless you've got other questions on that particular aspect, I'd like to move on maybe to the more subjective view, whether it's art. Okay. Can we, just before we go there, can we just talk a little bit about what it is in terms of the stone? And I appreciate we've, we've had this conversation before. You're not a ge geologist, so we're not going to sort of go deep down that route. But basically, it is a stone, we know that. We know it's a limestone. Yes. Where do we think it came from? The experts who have looked at this, and I do not claim to be a petrologist, the experts who look at this say it is um, con stone, which is an oolitic limestone of a particular type. Most of the Abbey stone, and if we look around the, uh, around the museum here, we've got uh, various bits of stone and pillar capitals, and we've got the great so-called ready uh, Abbey stone in St. James's Church, which is probably a capital from the Abbey. Um, they're made of Tainton stone, and Tainton is a quarry west of Oxfordshire on the River Windrush. But the fact this is a, in common stone, most prestigious stone, I think it gives us some indication just how important the people who made this uh, icon you know, thought it was. So we have a Norman king uh, who presumably has connections with Colne in Normandy, um, and I would guess is that there were other abbeys or cathedrals already been built in England prior to Reading. Yes, indeed. 1121, we know, it started. Yes. So others, which others were actually being built? Or well, been built probably the one that? most related to, to Reading is going to be in Lewis, uh, which was a Cluniac Abbey. And we come here to the fact that uh, initially Reading was founded as a Cluniac monastery. I'm choosing my word monastery very carefully here, and I'll come to that maybe in a second or two. Um, the Cluniac monks were invited by Henry to come from Cluny uh, to head up the new monastery, which was going to be his mausoleum, and that of all his descendants as well. So the first prior, the first head of the community of the monastery uh, here in Reading was from Cluny, but also monks from the Cluniac uh, monastery at uh, Lewis were called to be the first monks here. Um, we've got a pretty good idea of the numbers and who, well, not maybe the names, but the numbers uh, where they came from. The point I'm going to make, though, is that when Henry founded this, it was a priory. Now, the subdivisions of the monastery, the, the main Cluniac Abbey, with the word abbot meaning father, and abbey meaning somewhere where the father of the community lived, was in fact Cluny. Now, there were other Cluniac abbeys, very few. Most of them were priories and were under the control of Cluny. And every so often, the heads of the monastery would be all called back to a sort of big parliament, you might say, at Cluny, which is in Burgundy. Um, so it started off as a monastery, as a priory, and it was only in 1123 that it became an abbey, an abbey, abbey yeah. when in fact the, the prior of uh, Lewis, a chap called Hugh, Hugh uh, became the first abbot mm -hmm. of Reading. And at that point it became an independent abbey. It followed the Cluniac customs, that's the way, the way they worshipped, the offices and how they divided the day. Unlike, for instance, the Cistercians, who believed in going out into the fields and working, the Benedictine monks here at Reading spent virtually all of their day singing the Psalms, studying the Bible, uh, and in their monastery. That was their work, mm -hmm. the work of God, the mm -hmm. Opus Dei in Latin. Yeah. And so, okay, so I understand all that. Just a bit more on the, sort of the stone. So what we're saying is it's a prestigious stone, a type of stone, type of well carved limestone, brought all the way from Colne in Normandy. So we're getting the combination of a, a prestigious piece of, of rock. It's not been just dragged down the Thames, it's come all the way across the channel. They've taken care to choose what they want to use in structure, and then a sort of a high prestigious carving, which is leading edge in terms of what it's trying to depict. 
And then when you talk about the art, looking at the style of it, can, can we be able to look at it and say, well, this is we can date it from the look and style of the, the um, sculpture? I, I think this is what makes it unique. It's, uh, if not the earliest, I think, what well, arguably it is the earliest, along with what we see at Quennington, depiction of this sort of style, of this figure that I described earlier. Um, and it gets repeated by people like Rubens and Giotto and Fra Angelico, uh, El Greco. So many artists afterwards repeated the same imagery. And that's why I argue it is of artistic importance. Right. Forget all the religious side of it if you wish. Yeah. It is artistically so important because these great artists depicted this exact same, I can argue, exact same imagery, iconography. So it is so important. So it's one of the first pictures of this particular scene. In terms of the style of the carving, can, can we even say we can pair that with other um, carvings of a similar date? And can we, we can pitch it and say it's, we think it's early 1100s or what? Yes, I mean, I think uh, every, well, 11, 11 or mid 12th century, something in that region. So, so we can't be sure, that, assuming, of course, that it does indeed come from Reading Abbey, we can't be sure necessarily that it was, was part of the construction. It might have been could carve later, inserted later? Yes, um, I, I think that it was very likely came from Reading Abbey. Let's, let's face up to the fact it was not found on the site of Reading Abbey. In fact, it was found in Bower Marsh, mm. pulled down near Ship Lake, uh, by Adam in 1949. Um, but you've got to look around and say, well, where else would yes. have such a prestigious piece of carving, yes. stonework? Yes. There's one other contender, I have to admit, which is the Bishop's Palace, the Bishop of Salisbury's Palace, at, in, uh, in Sonning itself, which was uh, being Bishop's Palace, a yeah. bishop, you know, it was yeah. obviously a prestigious building. But I would still argue that the connection with the Virgin Mary, that in fact the monastery is dedicated to the, to the Virgin Mary, and that this is the most prestigious piece of carving on a, on a special stone, I think most yeah. people would say yeah, it must have come really from that. Do, do we have examples of of carving con stone in other ecclesiastical buildings of the time? Or was oh yes, I mean, if, uh, there, there are many. Uh, and uh, if I look at the stylization of it and the type of carving, it's, it's I would say, typical. I don't like using the word typical because you can always say, oh no, there's an exception here, an exception there. But um, there's a very famous uh, sculptor called Gisbertus, or Gisbertus, who lived in central uh, France, and he did many carvings very famous in Autun. Anyone wanting to look this up on the internet, you'll find that his, uh, his carvings are beautiful carvings, very detailed carvings, historiated, that to say, he gives a story. He might look at the creation, the fall of Adam, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the carvings we've got here in Reading tend to be rather abstract. There are, I'm just looking at them now, there are one or two that have got uh, figures on them, but most of them are just abstract designs, and that's what this makes this one quite special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can we tell from the style whether we think it was carved by possibly sort of Norman masons or sculptors mm. that come across mm. to build the abbey, or whether it was local sort of Saxons who were recruited and, and uh, yeah. I don't know how they were, they were forced to work, but, but certainly they, 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 because they were jobbing sort of groups or gangs of, of masons that were going around building these buildings. That's at the time. right. I mean, initially the monks would build their own monasteries and so on, but in time, as it got bigger and uh, needed more skilled workmen, of course, you had the skilled groups of gangs that went around. We, we know this. This is very well documented. Um, I would say regarding the style on that our stone here, that it was someone who was very adept, very skilled indeed. We here, Saxon or Norman, will never know. So, so we just can't, can't tell. We can't them. tell. Oh, okay. um, I, if you wanted me to put some money on it, I'd say it was a Norman, but uh, you know, I, I always seem to lose on the horses. So, yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't put my best on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so again, we, just, to, just to summarize, we've we, we got a sense that this is a very ornate carving, um, and it's artistically interesting and probably originated a number of pictures that follow it. Um, so that, again, adds to its significance. We, we, we think we're building your case, John. I hope, um, I hope, people, I hope you're being convinced that, yeah, yeah. that it's not just historically important, but yeah. it is also artistically important. And we should be very proud that it's in this museum. And I've, I've obviously got a few more questions, but um, wow. you, you're obviously making the case, I think fairly, fairly persuasively, 
Um, are other people of a similar mind? Are other people sort of similarly regard it as being highly significant, or are you a sort of an iconic yes, yes. I mean, uh, if I can go back to the uh, pillar capitals that we've got around here, most of which were discovered by a chap called Kaiser, Charles Kaiser, just before the First World War. Um, and they were discovered in Sonning again, not quite where the stone was, was discovered, but nearby. Um, and he went to Crimpton and he looked at this similar sculpture and he commented on its importance. Then when, 20, 30 years later, well, it was in 1949, Zoneski discovers it, uh, he wrote a very long article and so then gave various lectures saying just this, that it was very important indeed. Mm. So, and I don't think anyone's disputed that ever since. Good, good. And likewise, then, you mentioned Quarrington has been a very similar example. There, there are no other carvings like this anywhere in the, in the England, certainly. That, uh, I, I stand always to be corrected in these things, and it's very dangerous to say never, um, but I haven't come across any like this. No. Okay. So, and do we have any idea where it might have been located within mm. the Abbey? Uh, interesting, that. Very interesting question. Um, Ron Baxter, who wrote a marvellous book, published a year ago, two years ago, um, Reading Abbey, uh, he, he proposes it may have been a Templeton similar, or that not this particular stone, there may have been a similar design as a Templeton at the entrance to the chapter house. Right, you better uh, explain what Templeton is. Yeah, tim, um, uh, Templeton is the uh, carved archway over a door. Imagine a typical Norman archway. It's rounded, it's not pointed, and then in the infill space between the top of the door and the arch itself, that is the Templeton. It comes from the word drum, so it's a sort of upside oh, yes, down drum. Right, yeah. um, so he proposed that. Now, I'm going to the stage further and say, since this was dedicated to the Virgin and St. John, why wasn't it over the Great West Door, maybe? Yes, uh, yes. So maybe this was a theme that pervaded through the monastery. But, but, and it's a big but, we will never know. Not unless, not unless somewhere or other, someone digs up in the garden and finds, oh, I found something. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. It's news if it did. But uh, until such arrives, we just don't know. Okay. John, one, one of the points you made is that these two stones were found not here in Reading, but up at um, Borough Marsh in Wargrave. Um, and I, the highly knowledgeable friends of Reading Abbey will, of course, know all about what happened to the Abbey. But for those that don't, I mean, what the shocking thing was was a come dissolution in about 1539. What was a grand Abbey here in Reading would have been a splendid. Abbey that you know, really would be a city comparable to, to, to Winchester, Salt, wherever, and said sadly we have a, sort of a pile of flints. Um, so these stones were developed. Can you tell us a bit about what happened to the Abbey when it was uh, when it was dissolved and why these stones aren't here and indeed some ended up at Wargrave? Yes, a uh, very sad story indeed, really. And we don't have a great cathedral such as at Winchester. Um, we have our pile of rubble, as you say. Um, what happened was that the the, at the dissolution of the monastery, the town, I think, turned its back on the monastery. We have to be blunt about this and say that the relations between the monks and the town by this point were not at all cordial. Um, the mayor, as we call it now at the time, as himself, was very often in conflict with the monks about rights and taxes and so on and so forth. Uh, it would appear that the town chose, preferred to choose St. Lawrence's and St. Mary's as their churches, and St. Giles, the three main churches, rather than the Great Abbey Church. And it was soon brought to ruin, mainly, first of all, though, under Edward VI. And here we come into the contentious point about the wars of religion, um, where Protestants get Catholic to some extent. And one might argue um, that the stone here, the fact it's been defaced, Ruined. We don't know what on the other sides of it, for instance. It's a capital, so there'd be yeah. imagery all around it. That's been taken away, and even yeah. the actual image we've got, it's obviously been uh, chopped around a bit. Yes. But deliberately or not, we don't know. Yeah. So, during the time of Queen Mary, the Catholic Queen, strange enough, this ruination continued. And we do know, we've got written records, that many of the stones were taken yeah. from Reading to Windsor for the poor night's lodging. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, I went with um, a patrologist. Uh, Dr. Kevin Hayward, we went and visited uh, Windsor, they were very helpful, and we looked at the various stones there. And uh, they were taken down the river. Now, it's proposed, and I think quite logically proposed, 
that the stones that we've got around us were part of the shipment down river and some sort of accident or something uh, happened. Uh, fell off the back of the barge, I don't know. Yep. And um, they turned up in uh, Sonny and Borough Marsh. Yes, gosh. And then eventually made the way back to Reading Museum. Then, then, yes, yeah. when they were discovered uh, by Kaiser in 1914 and again by Charles uh, yeah. Zaleski in 1949, they were brought back. Well, initially, I believe, they were actually taken to the Coltold Institute. And I'm not sure about the legal status here. I'm not sure if the Coltold Institute gave the zones of permanent learn or gave, just gave them to the museum, but anyhow they had yeah, so here. an appropriate place for them to be. Quite right enough, because Absolutely. everybody could come and look yeah. at them. They'd come home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm conscious that we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, I, think, I think John's assertion is a highly significant piece of art um, and sculpture and tells us a tremendous amount about the history of what was going on at the time. Hopefully that's come through his talk. Um, I certainly have learned an awful lot about it. I didn't quite understand its, its significance. I think I do now. So I think you've made your case, John. Um, thank you very much for, for coming and talking to us. Um, and hopefully that's the first in a series. I'm not quite sure what the next one will be, but hopefully another one. Um, again, all about Reading Abbey and, and its lead up to the 900th anniversary next year. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>